this, Dan. Amen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Isn't it good to be in his presence and worship together? Connie and I, you would not be aware of this unless you're on my prayer partner team and you did not get an email from me this last Thursday. I totally zoned it. I did not even think about it because uh, we were in another world. We have been since uh, Monday and got back last night about 10 o'clock in a place where there is no ambient noise. Can you even imagine that? There is no ambient light. We are 15 miles outside of a town of 14,000 in Lebanon, Missouri. Our daughter and son-in-law and three grandkids just moved from Norco. He's a Southern California boy. Said, I've had enough. Sold their home there. Bought 40 acres in Missouri, little lake on it, and we got to go spend a week with them. It was pretty amazing. It's very cool. There's, where there's a lake, there are fish, right? <laughs> I took two of my rods with me and quite a bit of tackle, and I lost count of the number of bass that I caught. Oh yeah. <laughs> One of the coolest things, um, I had two of the grandkids out in the boat with me. And uh, the granddaughter, she said, you know, I have never caught a fish before in my life. If I catch any, she had a rod in her hand, she said, if I catch anything, it'll be the first fish I have ever caught. I was casting two, and I threw mine out, and boom, something hit it. And I said, Tabby, her name is Tabitha, Tabby, drop your pole and come over here. And so she came over, and she landed a four-pound bass. Do you have any idea how that big that is? It was awesome. And that was her first fish. That is very cool. That's, that's very cool. So Connie and I have had a wonderful time, and we're so thankful to watch God use our kids like, like he is. Um, it, it's it's a, a, a true privilege, and we're, we're grateful. Well, the last two Sundays here at the bridge have been pretty extraordinary, haven't they? Two weeks ago, we had a, a missionary speaker with us. And I'll be quite honest with you, I've been listening to missionary speakers all of my life. And I have never heard anyone who brought the message so powerfully of international evangelism as our speaker two weeks ago did. That was extraordinary. And what a privilege we had. I hope you were here to hear him. And uh, I love it how mission-oriented we are as a body, even... Uh, uh, as we prayed for and recognized missionaries this morning. That was truly extraordinary two weeks ago. And then last week, you're probably wondering, okay, we had this guest pastor in, and, and uh, the board's been considering him, so what's going on? Well, uh, good news. The, uh, uh, he has not yet made a decision, although uh, in conversation with our district superintendent, uh, Dr. Tom shared with me, that Pastor Craig and his family absolutely loved our church. They loved being here with us, and they are feeling very strongly drawn to us. There are just a couple of logistical things that need to be dealt with. Um, your board uh, was in total unanimity, in fact, unanimously uh, voted to recommend them to our membership as our next pastor. But as part of the Church of the Nazarene, you've got to understand there's a lot of hoops to jump through, okay? Not just to complicate things, but to make sure that we make a good decision on this. So the next thing that we're waiting for is for Pastor Craig, after our meeting with the board this uh, Thursday evening, and the decisions that will be made there will be shared with Pastor Craig, 
uh, upon his acceptance of our can we vote on you and call you as our pastor with a positive vote. When he says, yes, you may do that, then we will notify you. And hopefully next Sunday, we will announce a uh, pastoral vote uh, per our manual, our rule, uh, the, the way we do things as the Church of the Nazarene. Uh, membership must be notified two Sundays in advance of a pastoral vote. So hopefully next Sunday, uh, we will announce to you that vote. There will be two Sundays of announcement, and then basically the third Sunday, we will have a vote right after the morning service. All right, we'll try and make that as clear as we can and as simple for you as possible. But please know that your board, after much prayer and consideration and meeting extensively with Pastor Craig and the family, um, they have they're feeling very strongly led that this this probably is God's man for the hour for us. We will let you know every step of the way how it goes, okay? But we do have quite a process to follow because after, if let's say that we vote on him and we say, yes, we want you to come, he must say yes to our vote. And once he says yes, then he has 30 days to notify his church he has to notify the church where he is right now, and he is obligated to them for 30 days to, to stay there so that they can transition into a new pastor. So uh, we're probably looking, best case scenario, earliest would be middle of December for the pastor and family to be here. Uh, probably realistically, uh, they'll, it'll be the first of the year, but it won't be any later than that because... If they come, two of the kids are still in school, and they'll want to start the, the uh, spring semester here, undoubtedly. So there's a lot of things working here. Just wanted to keep you appraised, all right? So that's where we are with that. Uh, three weeks ago, we started looking at soul shifts. And I want to continue that today. Soul shifts. Of course, the, the first soul shift, the, the soul shift that's required of every person, if they are to have a relationship with God Almighty, is what Jesus called, he didn't use the term soul shift, he, he said, you must be born again. Now, that, that is the kind of soul shift that we're talking about. It's a fundamental change at the very core of who we are. The very first one is that born again soul shift from being a child of Satan. And if you're not a child of God, you're a child of Satan. Do you understand that? From being a child of Satan to a child of God. That's the very first one. It's the most basic it is the one, of course, we cannot make on our own. God salts our oats to make us spiritually hungry and thirsty for what he has, is offering to us, and we have the responsibility of saying yes to him. But in reality, this is relatively easy, this soul shift, because all we have to do is recognize, I need you, God. At, at present, I am your enemy. I am not one of your children. Please forgive me, clean me up, and make me your child. All we have to say is, yes, that's what I want, and God gives it to us. That's what we referred to last time as negative grace. God dealing with the negative parts of our relationship with him. He, he begins to break down the wall of separation that our sin has caused. That begins at that moment of being born again. That is the primary soul shift. But then God doesn't want us to stop there. He wants us to go on into what we labeled last time as positive grace, transforming grace. The, the Apostle Paul described it in Philippians chapter 3 as working out our salvation with fear and trembling. 
Now, he was not saying there that we have to work for our salvation. No, no, no. We're already saved. Once we have been born again, we have a new relationship with God. We are his children. But (laughs) that's just the very beginning. And then it gets tougher because God is requiring things of us. And these are the soul shifts that we're going to start looking at this morning that kind of flesh out what Paul was talking about, working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Let's look at them today. Uh, Before we step into it, I want to recognize David Drury and Dr. Steve Deneff. Those names wouldn't mean anything to you. Uh, They are some leaders within the Wesleyan movement of which we are a part. Uh, But I want to thank them for some of the seed thoughts that we'll be considering today and for the next few weeks. The first soul shift beyond that born again experience. What is it? Well, this soul shift could be seen as shifting from me to you. Uh, Now, I want to flesh that out a little bit. I'm reading a book right now uh, about emotional intelligence. Have you ever heard of emotional intelligence? It's our ability to get along with other people, basically. No matter what our personality or temperament, uh, if we are going to be emotionally intelligent, we are able to interact effectively with other human persons. This book um, really grabbed my attention, the author did, in the the very first, actually, is the introduction. And she said basically this. There are two types of people in the world today. One is the person who, when they come into a room, they say, I'm here. And the other kind of person, when they come into a room, they say, you're here. Do you see the difference? Now this doesn't, uh, we're we're not talking temperaments or personalities here. Uh, uh, The person who walks into a room and says, I am here. It can be that life of the party, you know, never lacking for anything to say, kind of a magnetic personality. It can be that person who is consumed with, aren't you fortunate that I just got here? Now the party can begin. But, but it's not just that. It can be a person who is suffering from a very, very poor understanding and image of themselves. And when they walk into the room, they're saying, everybody is looking at me. And they really don't want me here. If they really knew who I am, they wouldn't want me here anyway. You see, both are all about me whether it be out there or inside. But the person who walks into a room and says, you're here, is able to recognize and celebrate the fact that you are here and engage you and make you feel important and recognize the significance of the fact you're here and I care. Two types of people. The one who walks into the room and says, I am here, either positively or negatively, and the other, you're here. Me to you. This is a shift. This soul shift is a shift from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. Now, it really is the most fundamental of shifts. Because there's nothing more natural to us in our fallen state than selfishness. You don't have to teach a kid to be selfish, do you? It comes very, very naturally. In fact, one of the most difficult parts of being a parent, one of the most important responsibilities that a parent has is to help their child learn that he or she is not the center of your family, let alone the universe. Every kid, if you let them, will allow and or cause the family to center everything they do 
around him or her. It's, it's, it, it, it's that self-centered compulsion that is a result of that original sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve, when they first rebelled against God and human relationships begin to break and we became consumed with ourselves. I'll be very honest with you. When God wants to really get my attention, when, when, when he wants to bring me to my knees, and this happens periodically, he gives me just a little window. Thankfully, it's not a huge picture window. Just a little window into how self-centered I tend to be. See, for Christians, this soul shift from me to you, of course, it starts in our relationship with God. It starts with discipleship. Mark, in his gospel, chapter 8, he makes the statement, as did at least three of the other, uh, two of the other gospel writers. He says, if he's quoting Jesus, and Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my follower... You must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Turn from your selfish ways. Other ones, other translations render it deny yourself. Denying yourself, turning from your, from your selfish ways. The cross, all of these are death terms. Are, are you aware of that? Jesus is saying, if you are really going to follow me seriously, there are things inside of you that have got to die. Significant to me, one of the gospel writers, after that phrase, if you're going to follow me, God turned from your selfish ways, take up your cross, inserts the word after, take up your cross. He says, take up your cross daily. You see, this is not a one-and-done situation, this soul shift from me to you, God. It, it doesn't just... It, I, I count my experience of entire sanctification being totally sold out to God all the way back to my freshman year of high school at high school camp. There are too many folks, especially in our holiness tradition, that think that sanctification of experience, wherever it was, whenever it was in your experience, once you've done that, it's kind of a done deal. And you've made the shift from me to you, God. No, no. <laughs> take up your cross, die. Daily. It's a daily decision. To die to myself. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 verse 1. You, you probably memorize it. If you haven't, you need to. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living sacrifice unto God, which is your spiritual service of worship. I heard a peach preacher talking about this one time, and he said, the, the, this living sacrifice thing, this death to self thing is really necessary. It's a, it, it is non-negotiable. It's got to happen. He said, but the problem with the living sacrifice is living sacrifices tend to keep crawling off the altar. <laughs> Daily, I make the choice to shift from me to you, God. And of course, part of the problem with this is this soul shift is one that can be faked. And the only one who knows you're faking it is God himself. But, but we can't stop with the soul shift from me to you, God. 
This soul shift has got to be from me to you. From oriented to what's best for me to what's best for you. I'll be honest with you again. I don't personally have a lot of trouble with the shift from me to God. It's kind of a no-brainer. I was growing, I grew up in a very healthy home with a dad who loved me. He didn't know Jesus when I was a teenager or a child, but he did later. He was a very healthy dad, though, and ultimately came into that relationship with God. But I grew up in a healthy family. I have a very healthy understanding of authority. I am a man under authority. I live under authority, and I don't buck it. I, I just don't have anything inside of me that goes, I will do it my way. And I'm very fortunate that way. So part of this soul shift, though, that I honestly, I really, really struggle with is from me. Jesus, in responding to the Pharisees' question, what is the most important of the Ten Commandments? You remember what he said. It's recorded in in virtually every one of the Gospels, but Matthew chapter 22, he said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. Apparently, I am supposed to love you as much as I love me. (laughs) The the Apostle Paul goes a step further in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Wow. So, apparently, I'm not just supposed to love you as much as I love me. I'm supposed to love you more than I love me. Piece of cake, right? Oh, yeah! Oh, my goodness. Is this even possible? Hello. Is this even possible? The good news is, yes, it is. But only with positive grace, with transforming grace, with the power of God. It is impossible without God enabling this kind of love in you or in me. But please hear me, if you truly desire to shift from me to you, and you are willing to partner with God, the Holy Spirit will take you beyond yourself. Yes, He will. Let's go to another soul shift. Uh, another thing that, that, that must shift in the core of our beings is what could be called as a shift from being a slave to being a child. A slave of God to being a child of God. This is a shift in perspective regarding the way I see myself in relationship to God. Now, John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who believed in him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So this is the way God sees me. When, when, I, when I am born again, that very first essential, non-negotiable soul shift, I step away from being his enemy 
to being his child. But again, Paul takes it to another level. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, he says, So you, Christian, have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his children. The the soul shift of slave to child is a shift in perspective where I start seeing myself the way God sees me because of Jesus. David, I'm glad you're here this morning. I saw you. Where are you? Wave at me. Where's David? Oh, he's, he's in back. I understand your cataract surgery went good, right? Well, you, you can see. Praise God. Wow. All right, good. Well, I'm glad you're here. And what I'm going to do right now, uh, you will commiserate with, okay? Because uh, a week ago, not this last Wednesday, but the Wednesday before that, we were dealing with Romans chapter 13. And uh, that's all about submit yourselves to the governing authorities. And, and Dave, right from the very get-go in our study, he said, Now guys, please, do not get political about this. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that same plea to you here now in this. I'm trying to help us understand the, the perspective shift from slave in relationship with God to being God's child. Please keep your political stuff out and just hear me. What is, in our American culture, who is, the highest ranking, most powerful person in America? Hmm? The president. The president of the United States. Where whatever the president says normally is taken seriously around the world. It has global impact. Anybody who is a mover or shaker has any responsibility at all for his or her country, nation, cause, their ultimate goal is to have audience with the President of the United States. Now, I think we can agree on that, at least in principle. But now let's put some flesh on it. Let's look at the most recent president who had children while in the White House. Not gave birth to, but their children, young kids, were in the White House with them. That was President Obama. Now think about this. President Obama's oldest daughter's name was Malia. Think about Malia's relationship with the most powerful human being on the planet. Scores of people from around the globe would petition to have audience with the president and be denied. He just doesn't have time. There's no way. He, he, could, he could deal with everybody that wants to share their whatever with him. But what about his daughter? <laughs> Did Malia have to make an appointment and have it approved by his whatever secretary? Now, undoubtedly, they had a, an understanding, and, and President Obama's daughters had to understand there were times when it was not appropriate for them to ask, for them to approach their dad. But for the most part, the president's oldest daughter had her daddy's ear whenever she wanted it. You are a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And there is no inappropriate time for you to approach him. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? 
There is no inappropriate time. As far as God is concerned, you have all of the rights of His only begotten Son, Jesus. If you are a child born into God's family by faith in Jesus, Paul tells us you are joint heirs with Jesus. You are rightful heir to all that Jesus is and has. That's the way God sees you. The kind of soul shift that we're talking about is where you and I understand our privilege. We have total, free, instantaneous access to the God of all creation. Do you understand? You understand it here. Are you living there? See, this is a soul shift from slave to child. The author to the Hebrews puts it this way. Chapter 10, verses 19 and 22. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. A soul shift from slave to child. Can you do that on your own? No. This is all about positive grace. This is about God making available something to you Enabling in you, changing your perspective. There is no inappropriate time to come to God. Let's pray.